Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Crafting and Crime Daily. It's Wednesday, hump day, payday for me. Anyway, <laughs> and boy, was I on Timu. Yeah, like wine on rice. I was on Timu. Anyway, <laughs> um, had some stuff in my cart that they kept offering me lower and lower prices to. So just, you know, a little tidbit about Timu. So uh, this is the show where I recap live trials. My name's Rebecca, and I'm a former attorney, former nurse, and I've got a lot to talk about with this Beverly McCullum jack-in-the-box case. Some things that I have to correct from yesterday's show, because this stuff did not come out in the opening statements. It's as through the testimony, as the testimony is evolving, we're learning more and more about who's who and what's what, and yeah, who's on first, what's on second, yeah, that kind of thing. So this is uh, episode two of the Beverly McCollum trial, the Jack in the Box trial. Beverly McCollum is on trial for the murder of her third, is it third husband? Let me count. Hold on. I have to count. <laughs> She's had so many husbands. Good Lord. Um, one, two, her, th her third husband. Yeah. <laughs> Robert Carvalho. Now, this is the first thing that I got wrong from yesterday. I said that his real name was Juan Cintron uh, because he's an, he was an immigrant from the Dominican Republic. Well, apparently Juan Cintron was his alias and Robert Carvalho is actually his real name. Who knew? Okay. That came in through his daughter's testimony. Then the other thing that I got wrong is the kids. So apparently, Deneen is her daughter, Beverly McCollum's daughter, from her first marriage, which was to a man named Paul Deshane. And uh, she left Paul Deshane and took Deneen with her. After which, he dies of mysterious causes. Natural, natural causes. Yeah. Okay. Then um, she marries another man after that, a guy named Lenny Byam, who also dies of a natural death. Then she marries Robert Carvalho. 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 I'm not saying. I can't roll my R's like his daughter Cicely can. So, after she marries Robert Carvalho, Carvalho, Carvalho uh, they have Sicily. Sicily took the stand, and her testimony is interesting. Now, um, oh, I skipped one. Wait a minute. Uh, Lenny Byam, the second husband, she has Tasha. Yeah. So this is her MO. She marries these guys has a child with them, then leaves them, and they die of natural causes? Do we have a serial killer on our hands? Uh, we're going to talk about that. So right now, she's married to Robert Carvalho, and that's what that's the subject matter that we get. So she, uh, following the murder, or okay, Cicely takes the stand. Cicely, nice, beautiful girl, beautiful girl. At the time of the murder of Robert Carvalho in 2002, Cicely was eight, nine years old, she said. And um, she talks about her stepsister. She said, that we all had different fathers, which I just told you about. Um, at the time, they were living in Michigan in this Charlotte, very small town. And Robert was delivering newspapers out of his van. And now she says, we had two vans. He had a work van and they had the family van. And she said he would do odd jobs, handyman jobs. Whenever people needed him, he would go do these jobs. I need some coffee. And it's delicious today. Dunkin' Donuts decaf. Yeah. Can you imagine what I'd be like on caffeine, girl? Oh. Okay. Anyway. So she talks about a memory that she had when she was eight or nine years old. And I want you to hear this from her words. 
and um, it's very interesting. Take a listen. Uh, around the last time that you saw your dad alive, do you remember sometime in the middle of the, middle of the night getting up and then going somewhere? Yes, I remember um, being startled out of my sleep and rushed into our family van. Um, I was used to the turmoil, so somewhere along everything, I, I was asleep in the back of the van. I know we were driving for quite some time, just because I know Charlotte is a small town, and we were in there for a while on the road. Um, the sky was like early morning or late at late at night, like past midnight type time of day. Okay, and uh, you don't know. Would it be safe to say you don't know where you went? No. Okay. And if something happened that night, I, would you agree with me that this was a long time ago? Excuse me. Would you agree with me that this was a long time ago? Yes. Okay. And at that point, you're a little girl. You were nine years old. Yes. Eight or nine years. Okay. And uh, do you remember what you had for breakfast three weeks ago? No, I don't. Okay. Is that a significant event in your life? Definitely. Breakfast? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, would you agree what you're telling the jury today would be a significant event in your life? Yes. Okay. Would this be something that would make it easier to at least remember from that time? Yes. All right. What do you recall uh, happened next that night? Um, like I said, I remember falling asleep and being woken up by an explosion in the woods was the next I recall from that night. I sat up and looked out the back of the window where the explosion was coming from. I noticed my half-sister running from the woody area away from the fire. Our van was already pretty much moving, the door was open, and she was trying to catch up to the vehicle as, as if it was a getaway van. Um, before I could ask or even be too concerned about what was going on, um, my mother told me to lay back down and go to sleep. So I did. Uh, again, I was used to the turmoil, so okay. I was too scared to ask questions. I laid back down and went to sleep. So basically what your mom said when? Yeah. Okay, has that been consistent throughout your entire life? Yes. Now. <clears throat> so, this is what she remembers. Now, this is the family van. She thought her mom was driving because she said, I looked and I saw my mom in the front of the vehicle, but so I thought she was driving. But now we know Chris McMillan's testimony is that Deneen was driving and mom was in the middle seat. So maybe her memory is not accurate, but she wakes up to an explosion that she doesn't think is unusual for her mother. What? Yeah. Anyway, uh, she could not remember Chris being in the vehicle that night. She said he could have been. Uh, she says, I didn't look in the passenger seat. So, you know, he could have been there. I didn't, I, I don't remember. I don't have a memory of that. And frankly, you know, 2002. This is right after 9-11. You know, several months after 9-11, George Bush is in his first term of office. Um, I can't tell you what I was doing in 2002. I was working as an attorney. I, I know that. I, I can tell you the law firm I was working for, but I don't remember where I was living because I've lived in a lot of places. <laughs> My daughter says, Mom, you move a lot. I do. But I don't marry men, have babies, and then they die afterwards. No. But in any case, the next morning, she goes to school. Tasha, you know, she, normal school day. She says, my usual routine was I would come, as soon as I would come home from school, I would run down the basement stairs and give my dad a hug. And, you know, say hi to dad. And that day, there was a padlock on the basement door. She does remember that. And uh, she also, you know, she's like, where's dad? You know, and mom tells her, Beverly McCollum tells her, he took off. He went to Canada. He left us. 
what a horrible thing to tell this child. Yeah, your dad doesn't, he left us. My mom did that to me. Yeah, my dad, all right, this is terrible. My dad went to pick up my mother and bring my sister and brother to live where we were living. Um, we had gone ahead of him to just set up the house. And he comes back and my dog runs in the door. This is, this is one of those childhood memories that is burned into your brain. And I remember him telling me, uh, mom said she, uh, she doesn't want to come live with us. She, she said you could have the dog. What? Well, mom, as it turns out, my mother wasn't dead. <laughs> anyway, so they tell this girl, she, Beverly tells this young girl, your dad took off to Canada. And this is what this girl lives, grows up thinking that her dad took off to Canada. Yeah. But she thought, you know, she said she had the forethought to know that Canada, the border of Canada was within driving distance because um, they're in Michigan. You just go to Detroit and cross the border. Um, but all the vehicles were in the driveway. So she, it wasn't adding up to her, but, you know, this is what her mother told her. So they moved to Jamaica, where her mom meets uh, her mom meets um, a man named what's the who's the fourth guy, Riney McCallum. Yeah, she meets Riney McCallum in Jamaica, and she marries him. Has a little baby. The baby's name is. Um, I have to read it because it's not one that sticks out in my mind. The baby's name is Guantano. Guantano, little boy. Uh, she was she was always telling her daughter that her dad was going to come steal her from them. So her mom wouldn't let her use her name on social media. Didn't tell her why, but said, no, you cannot use your name on social media. So they made up a name. Her name on social media was Sissy Lee. Sicily. And this was what her mom had told her she could use on social media. Now, it was years later that this girl, this young girl, Sicily, she grows up. She goes into the reserves, the Army Reserves. She's going to college. Um and uh, she said, as soon as she got turned 18, she moved out. She says, I, that day I was packed in, my stuff was in the car and I was ready to go. And she said, mom came out with her walking cane and started beating the car and saying, you're stealing my car. She says, it was my, it was in her name, but I paid for the car. So I thought it was my car. Um Anyway, so she left. She left as soon as she could. She got out of there. But she said it wasn't until she was in high school that her mom had immobility issues. Uh, apparently, she had maybe a stroke of some, size, some sort. So what Cicely does is she goes back on social media under her own name, and then she starts contacting people in the Dominican Republic that she knows to be her relatives. She says, I was, I grew up in a family. I'm the only brown one, brown child in this family. Uh, I wanted to know who my relatives were from my dad's side. And I think she got in touch with a cousin and she had, she had met her grandmother years before when Robert was still alive. She knew who her grandmother was. And so her grandmother passes away. She, she goes to the Dominican Republic because now she's got a relationship with the, the family over there. And she finds out and she's fully prepared to see her father at grandma's funeral. Dad's not there. She said, I had a speech prepared and everything. For, you know, I was going to tell him off for leaving me with, you know, her, Beverly. And she goes, I had a whole speech prepared. He wasn't there. And the family let her know that they hadn't seen him since you know 2002 they've never seen him again so when she gets back home she decides i'm going to confront my mom now we're talking 2014 2014 12 years after the murders she confronts her mom 
she drives because she lives seven hours away from her mom. She drives the seven hours to confront her mother. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you hear what she says her mom told her was the real story. And pay attention when the camera goes to her mom. Man, her mother's giving her the death stare. Yeah. So listen to this story from Beverly. And uh, how far did you have to drive to confront your mother? It was three and a half hours. Oh, sorry. Uh, San Angelo to Houston, seven hours. And uh, were you confronting your mother because of what you learned uh, about your father in the Dominican Republic? Yes. Okay. What, uh, what happened when you got there? I remember being very direct with her, um, like, you know, showing up in her house, and she was kind of, like, surprised, and I just approached her with, Mom, I need you to sit down and tell me what happened to my father, or you're going to lose me forever. I've always been the apple of her eye, so I was hoping that she would take me seriously in that moment. Did she tell you what happened to him? She immediately went into tears, and she began to tell me, her version of the story. Okay. And this is something that you don't know personally. This is just something that she told you. Yes. Okay. What did she tell you about what happened to your father? Her words were that they had been arguing down in the basement and she was trying to get away. And as she went to go walk up the stairs, um, like facing the stairs, going up the stairs, there's metal bars that you could kind of put your hands through if you wanted to and then there's a wall to the right my mother's left-handed um and i remember my father always sticking things on that side of the staircase uh like you know anything semi sosa stuff or like a bat or a tool or something and so how my mom described it is that as she was going up the stairs my dad began to pull her by her ankles to pull her back down and that she grabbed the nearest thing she could with her right hand, which happened to be a crowbar is what she said. And she swung it like that, the back of her head, um, to try to like get away from him. And that her words, he started bleeding profusively from the head. All right, let me cut you off right there. And so, you indicated that your dad was a baseball fan. Yes. Okay. And uh, he had uh, baseball memorabilia. Would that have been stuff that he might have had in the basement in his area? Yes. Okay. Uh, but she didn't indicate that. She said she grabbed a crowbar. She said crowbar. And those were her words? Yes. Okay. And hit the victim, in this case, your dad in the head, uh, and he was bleeding profusely. Her words. Did she say where he went or if he fell down, anything like that? Did you ask her that? No, I didn't um, get too much in the details, just processing what she was saying. I do remember, like, asking her right away, and what did you do? Did you call the police? Did you call the ambulance? Like, I'm sure he had a chance. There was a history of domestic violence. Like, what did you do? And she said that she couldn't do anything um, before she knew it, Deneen and her friends. We're heading downstairs to finish them off. Okay. And uh, you stated, and she used the words, Deneen and her friends. Yes. Plural friends. Yes. Okay, not Deneen and her friend. No. All right. And uh, so she said that before she could do anything, Deneen came down on her own. Did she tell you that she yelled up? Did she tell you that she, anything or any detail of what happened? No. Okay, did you ask her? Um, no. Are you just listening at this point? Yes. Okay. And um, at that point, she told you, Deneen, uh, finish the mom. Did she mention anything about uh, why she didn't call for help afterwards? She just said that before she could do anything, Deneen and her friends were coming down the stairs. 
to okay. finish him off. Now, let me ask you this. Deneen and her friends are going to finish him off. What? So you would think, okay, Cicely goes to the police. No, she didn't ask any questions. She did ask, you know, wh uh, why didn't, she was asked, why didn't you re report this way? She goes, because my mom was the only family I had, you know, besides the ones in Puerto Rico, but she's my mom. I've always wanted family and my only family was my mom, uh, even though she didn't really like her mom that much. Anyway, she sits on this information for till 2016. But in 2015, we learn through the detective that takes a stand that, uh, you know, he walks the jury through how the body was found. Well, let me back up first. First, we hear from the guy that owns the property where the body was found, Gordon uh, Divery. And he talks about how the day before he discovered this body, May 7th of 2002, he goes on to his property. Now, he describes this property as being in Grand Haven Township of Michigan. And he says they have, uh, he says it's about 90 miles from Charlotte, where this guy was from. He says it's a 60 acre piece of property and it's surrounded by woods. But in the middle of this woods is a blueberry farm. Can you imagine? I want to go there. Anyway, um, so he said to get there, you have to follow this two track road, which, you know, a dirt road, uh, about 75 yards through the woods. Um, and then you'll come to this gate. Then you open the gate and you can go in further. So on the seventh, he was with his father. He opens the gate. They go in uh, and they are looking for turkeys. And uh, he's asked, well, what did you find that day? He goes, well, we didn't find any turkeys. So he comes back the next day. I don't, his father wasn't with him, but he comes back the next day, goes through the the gate. Now, this is May 8th of 2002. He goes through the gate and he notices a pine tree that's charred. And he's like, this was not this way yesterday. So he goes out of his truck, he approaches the, the, the charred pine tree and he sees this trunk and this body. He goes back into his truck and he's Decides he's just going to drive around the property. He can't believe he's just seen what he's seen. He's like, I, I you know, I, he's, I was hoping like if I went back there, it wouldn't be there. <laughs> I just don't know if my eyes were playing tricks on me. So he did not have his cell phone. So he goes and gets a neighbor who's got a cell phone. They go back. He says, I brought him with because I just want to, you know, I just wanted to make sure it, what, what I was seeing was really what I was seeing. And then he calls 911 and he tells him, uh, I found a bob body on my property. And she's like, what kind of body? He's like, a dead body. <laughs> it's been burned. It's on my property. So the police come out and they start their investigation. So the next person on the stand was the detective, Robert Donker. Now, they talk. he talks about the investigation. The dental work from this guy was unusual. And they thought they would be able to identify it through a dentist. Because the bridge, it wasn't, the way this bridge was done in his mouth was not the way U.S. dentists do it. So they figured out he had had it done probably in a foreign country. So that made it even more difficult to identify this guy. So what this Robert Donker did was, that's not weird, Robert Donker did? <laughs> He called this filmmaker that he knows and he says, would you like to do a documentary on this dead body that we can't identify? So the guy agrees to do this documentary and they call the documentary Jack in the Box because they don't know who this guy is. And it was this guy's hope, the, the filmmakers hope that just one person, uh, they left it up on the web. They said just one person would watch it and reach out to them and help them identify this 
this man. And this detective said this case sat there for years and years. And every now and then he'd get a call and somebody thought they would have some information and they didn't. But after this filmmaker puts this documentary up, they get a tip from someone who, a woman who identifies herself as Beverly McCollum's stepdaughter. Or not stepdaughter. Yeah. Yeah. Beverly McCollum's daughter. But she thinks she knows who the dead body is. Because around that time that they found this yeah, you know, she said she watched part of the documentary. She recognized the trunk as being part of a set of trunks that her mother had. And uh, this turned out to be Deneen, the person who's already been convicted of first degree murder of Robert Carvalho, is serving a life sentence. She's the one that made the phone call, which makes me reevaluate this whole case. Like, wh what? What? This woman is spending her, the rest of her life in prison and she's the one that confessed to it. So apparently when she, when they went to interview her, she did admit to her role in the murders, the murder. And they were able to positively identify Robert. She told, she told him about this Chris guy. This was in 2015 that this phone call was made. They find Chris in 2016 and then he confesses. But she was offered a plea deal to second degree murder in exchange for testimony and she refused. She went to trial. She rolled the dice and got convicted. First degree murder. So she's spending the rest of her life in prison where mom is on trial for second degree murder because of this. And some of you ask about me mentioning the federal government. Yes, the federal government was involved in getting this woman extradited from Italy. And it was strange because when the hearing I listened to back in October, the judge mentioned getting letters from uh, the immigration department. And, you know, because so the federal government was absolutely had their hand in this. And. Um, some of you did reach out to me and tell me that Michigan does not have the death penalty. So I'm assuming that this prosecutor is just upset because by virtue of the second degree murder charge, the most she can get is um, probably 15 years, 15 years. Yeah. Michigan uh, rather than a life sentence. So, sh but can they get her for something else? We're going to talk about that. Now, I'm not sure if this woman is going to testify, Deneen. Like I said, she's serving her life sentence and she's got appeals pending. So probably not. So I wanted to talk about Beverly McCollum's history. We know she marries Paul DeShane, has Deneen, the girl that's the woman that's serving the life sentence, she leaves Paul, takes her daughter, and then he dies of natural causes. She marries a man named Lenny Byam. She has Tasha. She takes Tasha and Deneen, leaves Lenny, and he dies of natural causes. Then she marries Roberto Caballo, the subject matter of this murder trial. She has Sicily, murders him, <laughs> and he's not identified for 13 years, flees to Jamaica, marries a guy named Riney McCallum, has Guantano, a little boy now. So now she's got three girls and a little boy. Robert McCallum is missing and to this day has never been found. We don't know where he is. Yeah. Jamaica has him listed as a missing person. So then at this point, she moves back to Texas. But what I picked up, up on through Cicely's testimony is she gets back to Texas. They move in with their grandmother, Beverly's mom. Then they have to go pick up Beverly from the border of New Mexico 
from the Mexican border because rather than just fly into Texas, Beverly flies to Mexico from Jamaica and comes across the border. I, was she trying to not, I don't know. Maybe she thought they were after her. I don't know. Very weird. In any case, Beverly meets this Pakistani teacher online and all of a sudden, mom dies. Mom gets ill. Mom dies. So then she, uh, and this Pakistani guy comes to the U.S., marries her, and then she goes to Pakistan with him. Now, I don't know if she had any kids with him. <laughs> She's still married to this man. Um, they move from Pakistan to Rome, Italy, which is where she was picked up uh, on this arrest warrant for murder. Then it was through this government, this government, um, I don't know, negotiation that Italy extradited her back to the U.S. under the condition she was not to be tried for first degree murder. Yep. Now, her son, I'm thinking, oh, is he going to be in court? Are we going to see him? No. He passed away in November of 2022. They find his body. And uh, not sure how he died. <laughs> yeah. Now, I heard... Uh, it could have been a heart condition from something he was born with that was never treated, a hole in his heart. I don't know. But a lot of mysterious deaths surrounding this woman. And uh, unfortunately, Jamaica is a different country. So they're not going to be able to try her for his death, uh, the, the fourth husband's death, if they ever find his body. Uh, and do they need to reinvestigate the first two deaths? I don't know. How interesting is this, though? This is a really, really interesting case. So, Are we hearing the truth? Is Chris McMillan telling us the truth? Is that what really happened? I want to hear what Deneen had to say about what really happened. I don't think she took the stand in her own defense. Um, so, I mean, what really happened to this robber guy? We don't know. All we know is what Chris McMillan has told us yesterday in yesterday's episode. So I hope you enjoyed this um, episode. <laughs> Don't forget, this is available as a podcast through YouTube Music. And uh, I would love it if you'd subscribe, hit that thumbs up button, and I will see you tomorrow in Crafting and Crime Daily. Take care, everybody. Bye.